Hello and welcome to the Air and Salt podcast. I'm your host, Richard Arsenault, and we talk about everything from technology to entertainment to everything in between. And uh, today we're going to talk about a convention that I went to yesterday in Las Vegas called the National Association of Broadcasters. Some of you may be aware of it, but probably majority of people aren't. And it's basically a convention uh, that's held annually every year, right around April. And all of the biggest and best get together there. They demonstrate the new technologies and uh, allow people to uh, check out the new stuff that's coming in film and television. Uh, this year was a particularly interesting one uh, in that uh, artificial intelligence was the background uh, noise at the place. Now, uh, every time you go to NAB, there's always a new technology that's coming. For instance, uh, back when they were trying to decide on high definition, uh, there were all these different formats to be decided. Now we know. Uh, you know, high definition is 1920 by 1080, uh, approximately, um, depending on, you can go 720, whatever. These are words we all understand, but in the past, we didn't know what the definition of high resolution was going to be as we transitioned out of NTSC, you know, the old TV tubes you used to watch Bonanza on, uh, you know, the cathode ray tubes, uh, as opposed to LCD displays. Yeah, you would... Um, have to make that decision, what was the best format? I remember there were hundreds of them. Now today you can pretty much make your video any size you want to, but there are standards, right? And so the National Association of Broadcasters obviously uh, adopts these standards and um, the rest of the uh, industry has to follow. So what was interesting about it was every time you go there, there's a new buzz. And this year the buzz was artificial intelligence, but Nobody really had much to show, which is interesting. They're all developing it in the background, but all the hardware manufacturers, you could feel it everywhere. All of the software manufacturers uh, were uh, vibing with the fact that a lot of the traditional ways of making movies is going to go away. Right. And I believe that's why Tyler Perry decided not to build or to, to make a change to his construction plans. If I'm not mistaken, it was an eight hundred million dollar studio he was building in Atlanta. You know, I had worked there. I worked in his second studio, um, but I think he was building a brand new one um, and decided that it was just too dangerous to invest in hardware anymore. I don't want to speak for Mr. Perry, but uh, it was uh, and facilities. It was much safer to think about the future of generative AI and how we're going to be moving. So uh, in this podcast, I just want to briefly talk about my experience at NAB. And um, uh, but you could literally feel like the air getting sucked out of the room by this uh, massive, invisible AI uh, loom, looming on the horizon. Now, the concept would be that you can uh, now, uh, I use Adobe Premiere, and I spent quite a bit of time at the Adobe booth with some really intelligent people. And they were telling me about the new functionality uh, that is already existing in Adobe Premiere, and a lot of it has AI roots to it. Um, but they were also talking about stuff that has, I've seen demos on it, that doesn't exist yet uh, for the public. Um, so you can... A, a simple example of what you can do right now is in the past when you have music, uh, especially track music uh, that you buy from a music library or you license it or um, from a, a third party, then you can slice and dice and cut that music. And it's like when you cut a piece for extra or whatever, uh, where you had a, a two minute, 30 second piece, um, you would constantly be starting and stopping clips of music during that as part of the style of cutting that day of air stuff. Now, instead of me having to find the exact beats like I'm, I do all the time, I've gotten pretty um, instinctive on it. Now, um, they'll analyze the music for you. I mean, it won't listen to key signature changes and stuff, but it will get you exactly on the beat. And you can just drag your music longer or shorter. And Adobe will actually change it for you automatically. That's that's a huge time saver. Um, artistically. You know, does that take away a little bit from it? Yeah. But um, 
when you're doing music that's going to be in the background anyway, it's not symphonic music. It's just, uh, you know, standard stock music. Um, you would call it almost like boring. That music, uh, you can easily get away with those manipulations by just having the AI shorten or lengthen the track. That's just one of the many features they showed me. Now, the, now this is where AI would have to get a lot more intelligent because I score my stuff too, meaning uh, I don't play the music, but I will take um, music that's been composed that's symphonic music. Now, that does require a lot of intelligence on a human level to manipulate it. So, I mean, you want to you go with the, the key signatures, you want to go with... Um, the harmonics, uh, the sound of it, and you want to make it symphonic, and you can literally re-edit a piece of symphonic music uh, with your mind, but AI wouldn't know what to do with that. It would simply try to find the beats and match the beats. So um, it's not a catch-all. There's still a definite need for uh, creativity when it comes to like cutting music for pieces, but it just depends on the kind of music you're listening to. Okay, so um, some of the other features they, they demonstrate is the ability to... Uh, do other things automatically. But ultimately speaking, um, uh, ultimately speaking, there's not a whole lot of change going on in that direction. Now, what I want to do is work on new methods of delivering content to people that are, it's more server-based, meaning you don't just have a linear uh, piece of media. Like when you, when you go turn on Netflix or or Prime, you know, you press play and you watch it and you can rewind it and go forward, but that's it. It's just two dimensions. Um, it, it's just it's just flat, meaning you can't go into it. The only way you could actually go into it would be to go into like an advertisement link and you could click on that and then get taken elsewhere. But the actual film, there's one film and that's it. That film has been created by a very extensive team of um, experts or maybe just a um, a handful, but regardless, um, the film itself has been locked and you're not going to watch a different version of it. But in the future, you know, let's break apart that linear storytelling aspect and let's customize it based on the viewer and based on your needs. Um, it can still be a very interesting and compelling story, but in the same way that you can truncate music uh, artificially now, how about truncating a story? Um, now they're already doing that, but it doesn't turn it into a film, meaning they, uh, Amazon web services, um, they'll analyze your film and they will, uh, analyze it to the frame. Uh, they'll detect what the, uh, content is, um, and then artificially allow you to insert, uh, advertisements and so forth. But the advertisements would be custom bit, depending on the third party that's doing it. Um, they will notice that there's a woman on the screen who's wearing a white dress. I mean, you've all experienced this by now, I think. And then when it suggests uh, ads to you, it will, it will. if you want to pause it and say, I'd like to buy that dress, it'll suggest different dresses that look similar to that based on analyzing the video. Um, so it's already analyzing the video, but um, what we'd like to do in the future would be that uh, that those analytics of the video itself translate into reformatting and reshaping the actual content that you're watching uh, artificially based on either your preferences or um, based on perhaps another person, a third person that you don't know may have done a remix of a film, you know, in a way. And uh, even a film like, I don't know, Jurassic Park uh, could be expanded or changed and swapped around. You could even change the story if you get creative enough. Uh, there'll be moments in which you would have to uh, generate the images. But for the most part, uh, filmmaking is a big collection. It's a big warehouse of um, uh, creative content, right? And so that warehouse usually is thrown in the trash can. What I'd like to do is exploit every last piece of creativity that went into that production. Um, including some of the early conceptions, because people are interested. Let's say they go to Jurassic Park and they want to see the velociraptors. And I happen to know the guy that actually animated those velociraptors. Um, um, and um, you could say, hey, Don, how did you do that? 
and um, he could go into great detail, or you could just go back and watch the movie, or you could perhaps even go into a video game based on the Velociraptors, and maybe AI would even incorporate that into a Jurassic Park game, or might just make it from scratch. You know, the creativity is going to be what AI does. So, uh, like I said. <clears throat> The floor of that, uh, of those, you know, the North Hall and South Hall and stuff at the convention center in Las Vegas is always filled with, you know, untold millions of dollars worth of new equipment. But yesterday, I mean, the equipment was all shiny like it always is. It's all very, very good. But I mean, we're, we're getting, you know, we got 8K capture now where uh, that means the resolution is not just um, the standard resolution you get, but it's 8K. You know, obviously we go up a lot higher than that too, but um, that stuff wasn't that interesting, right? Because we all, we have a good enough resolution. We have these great cameras now that do all the work for you, essentially. I mean, there, there, there's a need for the artists to use this equipment, but what happens when you don't even need to film someone and you can just generate them? Um, absolutely you can um, like I said, Amazon Web Service already can analyze video and break it down. Um, it can even analyze the segment that is about to, th this is specifically to advertising, but it's a much bigger concept. They can say this section was PG-13 by looking at the content and by transcribing it and listening to it. And it can say, well, um, why don't you advertise something more appropriate for older people at this point? Don't advertise um, something for a younger than 13 audience here. So it'll choose the right ad based on the content that it just viewed. So it's literally viewing and analyzing your, your video ahead of time. And I'm sure that uh, this is very common at this point. You know, some of the social media companies already do this as well, obviously, to protect their audience base, but also to analyze content when they wouldn't humanly have time to be watching a a billion, what is it? How many minutes per day does YouTube get uploaded, for instance? So that's going to be very exciting. Um, but also then there's going to be, uh, obviously, there's a backlash. I mean, after the writers strike and the Screen Actors Guild strike um, got concluded and uh, someone very accurately predicted it wouldn't be concluded until September, um, and I, I don't know exactly when it was wrapped up, but I think it was September of last year. Um, a lot of people are complaining there is no more work. Um, these showrunners, people that actually run these TV shows, uh, they're saying that, you know, they're, they're going to have to drive DoorDash. And by the way, good luck with that. <laughs> Been there, done that. Uh, DoorDash is not. Uh, that's a whole separate topic. But let me just say it's the most abusive possible way to make money as a freelancer. And I think everybody should have to, uh, every top executive, what they call that C, in the C-suite, <laughs> they should be forced to DoorDash for a week just to realize what the what the hell other people are going through. It is not a fun way to make money, let me tell you. Um, and uh, also, you know, having to fight the AI in DoorDash, it just shows you that having an AI overlord is a little scary because DoorDash will deliberately slip in these really bad deliveries because no one's going to take them and it'll stack them on top of each other. So you get one order that's a nice order locally, then another order that's easy to get to a nice restaurant. But then the third order will be slipped in there and that's going to be like a 15 mile drive with zero tip. And you're going to end up losing a lot of money on that and probably into a bad neighborhood that no one else wants to go into. Yeah. Welcome to the world of AI overlords. Um, it's not transparent and you have to constantly watch your back when you have an overlord. So Hollywood, you're, you're jumping out of the uh, what is it called? Frying pan and into the fire. If you think that you can supplement your income uh, using the same AI that they claim has taken away your job. It's difficult. What you need to do instead is learn new skills, go back to school, get another degree. That's what I would tell you. And if you've been basing your creativity and your income on just creativity, and I say just creativity, meaning, um, you know, you're not, um, you're not Mark Twain. I mean, you're not creating the most amazing work ever. You're just creatively cranking stuff out that we all do in the television industry. Sometimes it's glamorous. Sometimes it gets a lot of attention. Sometimes it's artistic and beautiful, but for the most part, you're cranking stuff out. And uh, that cranking out process, that's what's going to be replaced with AI. And I'm talking about an entertainment too. 
Yeah, and I wanted to also mention that ChatGPT uh, is interesting because it's really, really good at language. And uh, there's probably no one out there that doesn't know what ChatGPT is, but if, if, if you're one of the lucky few that don't know what it is, it's artificial intelligence, it's a large language model. And um, um, you have to ask people smarter than me as to exactly how it works, but essentially speaking, uh, it goes out and gathers all this information out there, it learns from it, and then it spits back information to you. Problem is, though, they have built in biases. Some of these biases are ridiculously obvious. Uh, if you ask about some of the more um, turbulent topics in the internet or whatever, just type that into ChatGPT and see how it does. And it'll give you a lecture. It'll scold you. It's like, why are you yelling at me? But it will. It'll literally uh, become belligerent with you. But what's really interesting about it is that it's very bad at logic. So if you type an equation in to ChatGPT, um, if you ask it very specific questions about, uh, in some cases, math, in some cases, um, science, in some cases, uh, uh, learning about topics that are, um, there is only one right answer. There's not two. Like one plus one equals two. It doesn't equal five. So... But sometimes the, the large language models will get that wrong. And it's really weird. So you'll ask it a question that you know the answer to. And it'll get it wrong. And then you can take that answer and you can spit it into another platform. Perplexity is one I use, BARD. And you can have the large language models fight with each other. And not directly, which would be cool, but indirectly. You can copy and paste. Boom. You can say, hey, BARD, ChatGPT just told me that... Uh, that one plus one equals five, what do you think? In some cases, Bard will say, oh yeah, that's right, I agree. And it's like, why are you both hallucinating? What the hell's wrong with you? And you go to a third one and perplexity will say, uh, no, neither one of those are correct. This is the actual answer. And then you take the answer that perplexity gives and you feed it back to ChatGPT and you say, hey, perplexity said this. And ChatGPT will apologize profusely and say, oh, my bad, you're right. Yeah, perplexity was correct. And then, um, you can just go back and back, back and forth indefinitely and have these AI models just fight with each other. Sometimes they never get the answer right, by the way. They can't. So people that think that this is true artificial intelligence have to understand um, the limitations of that technology. But then, but you should use it. Um, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Just use it. So one of the things I, I like about going to NAB is the international crowd there. And it's really cool hearing all the different accents, hearing all the different language. Sometimes you just want to say, what language are you speaking? That's such an interesting language. I've never heard it before. Um, but it's cool that all these people from around the world come to, to Las Vegas as sort of the unifying place regarding broadcasting. So it's it's not only cool to be around international people, but it's cool to be around my co-patriots, many of whom are coming from Los Angeles as well. And there's just a distinct difference. It's interesting when you're um, talking to the locals who work at these conventions, uh, you'll notice just the, the distinct difference in culture in a way, the more la more more laid back and casual nature of the people who, who actually live in Vegas versus the people who come here from the outside world. And um, that's part of what's fun about NAB as well. Another thing that was weird was they have, um, there. there's some construction going around by the, convention center. But in order to get to the hall that has Amazon Web Services, for instance, uh, I believe that was the North Hall. Um, I think it was. and But you had to actually go into a tunnel. Uh, you have to walk down, escalate, you have to go down an escalator into the tunnel. It looked, felt very much like a subway. And sure enough, down there are all these Teslas. And uh, yeah, Teslas, the kind that Elon Musk's uh, creates. And uh, you get inside the Tesla and then they drive you through these tunnels. It feels a little bit like Harry Potter or something. It's crazy. And then, um, so I thought it was autonomous. I thought the cars were driving themselves. I assumed it would be. I heard that was the case. But no, these narrow tunnels, uh, there's nothing scary about it until you realize, oh my God, the guy is actually driving the car. And these tunnels do not allow very much room. So like, what happens if you flip out and <laughs> maybe the car would correct itself and you, you know, go left and you go up the side of the darn tunnel. It's a round tunnel. What if you went up and the car just, you know, there's so many things that I don't understand why that's um, um, being allowed to be 
manual, but I guess the autonomous cars aren't capable of safely transporting people yet, but someday they will. So that's, it's very interesting going through that tunnel. Um, surprisingly far. I mean, it's, come on, it's Vegas, everything is so spread out. It's like, oh my God. So the car, but it's like a two minute ride and then you get off and it's free because you're at the convention, whatever. So what else can I tell you about the convention that's interesting other than the fact that Starbucks costs $8 for a little bottle? Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, bring your own water and drink lots of it when you're there. Anyways, the convention wrapped up yesterday. I'm so glad I got to go. And okay, well, thank you for watching this, albeit short podcast about the National Association of Broadcasters and uh, convention yesterday and about the future of AI and uh, sort of, again, the vacuum that was in the air being created by these new technologies coming. Cool, man. Well, I'm done. Um, thank you for watching this podcast. And I'll see you next time.